We are our project managers. It's 100% owner involvement. The size of our firm, that's, that's a big selling point. I'm a little bit of a control freak, so I like to have control of everything. And that comes down to the level of quality. It's like the old Ronald Reagan saying, trust but verify. So I have to verify all the jobs. And my, my cousin John is the same way. Welcome to episode 131 of the AFT Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Levitt. And in this episode, we have Michael Connolly from Greenside Design Build out of Chicago. And I was really excited to have Michael on. We've conversed a lot through the Clubhouse app, uh, through Instagram, met in person, and Michael's done a great job with his business. And we really dove into hiring. You know, how does that work with employees? How do you find good talent? How does it, what software do we use? What accounting software? You know, building schedule. How do you set those expectations? All aspects of the business and pipeline and how we're training the next generation. There's so much valuable content with Michael. So without further ado, let's get started. And just a reminder to sign up for the Contractor Coalition Summit. It's that simple, contractorcoalitionsummit.com. Morgan and Jamie from Construction of Style, Nick Schiff with NS Builders and I will be hosting this. This will be in Nashville on Sunday, May 1st through Wednesday, May 4th. It'll change your business. Go sign up. We'll see you there. So welcome to the AFT Construction Podcast. I'm Brad Levin. And today we have a special guest, Michael Connolly with uh, Greenside Design Build, owner partner. So welcome, Michael. Thanks, Brad. How are you this morning? Really good. Afternoon. I know we're speaking offline that uh, probably a little better because of weather in Phoenix. This is like the optimal time to be in Phoenix as opposed to probably your neck of the woods. Actually, we didn't have such a bad day today. We're touching 60. So, oh, uh, that's so nice. Feels, feels like 85 to us. Today. <laughs> Guess we'll take it. 85 and no, or uh, 60 and no snow. That You can't beat that. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take it for sure. Well, it's interesting. I want to get into this a little bit because we're also speaking about the Build a 20 program. As you know, I'm heading out to my Build a 20. You're part of one. And um, unfortunately, I was supposed to uh, crash your Build a 20 dinner in Orlando, but plans for me kind of changed a little bit. I had to get sidetracked and you were able to sit down with some of my team. But you know, I wanted to start this just speaking about the design process. I know you and I have gone back and forth on scheduling, design, hiring, some of the topics you want to discuss. So from your side, you know, when do you go through and, and finalize that selection process? Sure. Uh, I'll jump into that in a second. But before I go too far, I just wanted to give you my condolences, Brad, on, on your father. I know you, you talked about the, the Builder 20 meeting that we were going to have or the dinner that you had to miss because you had some unfortunate circumstances. So I just want to let you know that our heart went out to you and your family. Well, that thank you. Thing, I appreciate so. that. But uh, moving on to some brighter news. So yeah, yes, the selection <laughs> process. So yeah, I'm pretty heavily involved in that in our company. Um, most of our projects do have interior designers. Um, the projects that don't, um, it's basically me um, jumping in for the interior design work. Um, that's few and far between now. Uh, that our projects are getting a, and higher dollar value. Um, but once I have the selection from the designer, I, I'm the guy that basically puts it through the formal approval process. I upload it to Builder Trend. I upload it to DocuSign. I get the customers to sign off on it all um, just to make sure it's it's put to bed. Let me ask you this. When you, and I know this is probably more few and far between right now, as you mentioned, as you're working with designers, but when you don't have a designer, this is something we've really struggled with. Uh, you know, we've had this uh, philosophy, as you know, for the last few years that unless the client has a designer, we're not going to do the project. And because the struggle I had is when they didn't have a designer, the burden that it puts on you, right, Michael, because you're managing this or myself. To For go sure. through and select everything and organize it and document it and make sure there's no mistakes because it's not like this is your one only project. I mean, how do you even manage that at your level, especially with the scale of projects you're doing? Well, it, it, it is a lot of work, uh, especially at this level. I mean, thankfully, you know, decades of experience that helped me navigate that process. I know where the mistakes are typically made. Um, so I try and you know, patch all those holes where mistakes can be made as far as sign sign offs um, and approvals. That's so important because you know someone's word is as good as the paper it's written on when it comes to these selections. If if it's not written down, it's not selected. It's not approved. Um, so that's where I push it hard at, is on the sign offs. Now, our one of our recent projects, we had a a client that did not have a designer. She had an eye for design as a lot of people say they do, um, but she actually did. 
she actually did. She was really sharp. The house turned out awesome. Um, so I didn't mind stepping in as a, I guess, co-designer for her. She didn't have the ability to, to draw um, elevations and sketches and cabinet drawings. I have a background in that. So I stepped in and I did that. I still draw by hand <laughs> back to those old days, but I swore to myself, this is the last time. So now we definitely push um, the owners to have a designer. And if they don't, we have kind of a, a quasi in-house designer that we've been working with. We actually built her house last year and um, she's been great to kind of bridge the gap between someone that has a, a decent budget for a designer and someone that has no budget or no idea. And it's important, especially in these high end customs, you know, better than anyone, Brad, how, how important it is. Yeah, it's difficult. I, you know, be, even the complexity, I think you bring up a good point where you're saying, Michael, that, yeah, we have to have documentation, you know, sign offs and coordination and make sure everything's approved, you know, whatever your system through Build a Trend DocuSign that you're using. But more importantly, you know, I look at this, what, what's really tough is when a client makes a selection, you know, die lots can change. You know, if it's natural stone, the actual blend that they get, depending on when it was cut out of the mountain, you know, six months, a year later is totally different. And so, just the amount of samples, right? And storage and sign-offs and disclosures that have to go through. I mean, it, it, it's monumental. And I don't think that most clients, even some of them may have an eye for design, realize just the amount of documentation to make sure, hey, you're both on the same page when it comes time to install. 100%. 100%. And it, uh, <laughs> you mentioned die lots. We, we've been doing this long enough where we have kind of form disclosures, so to speak, on Everything. natural stone yeah and it's just you know you go into the file and you bring it up say here i know i told you about it but i want you to sign this die lots can change um wood is another big one wood is a natural product you can t stain the same piece of wood two different ways and it's going to look different you know it's it's uh it's something that we you don't catch it every we don't catch every single one but we try to you know it's always a an improvement process so so going back, without sharing, of, of course, how much, I mean, how do you, when, when you have a designer such as this last experience and you're doing some of the drawing and elevations because you do have experience with that, are you managing that outside of like the normal contract? Are you charging them maybe per hour or are you, are you doing it just as like a customer service? <laughs> this is where you're uh, reprimanding me here. No, I'm not. <laughs> and, and I should be, you know, I should be. Um, yeah. What are you, you know, doing, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> No, that's not the point of this podcast. It's definitely yeah. not like a point of finger. I'm just curious. No, I don't. And I should be. Um, and that's part of the reason why I swore, you know, I'm never going to do that again. I, I probably will do it again, but um, <laughs> it depends on the client too. The, this particular client was just great and easy to work with. So I didn't mind, but um, yeah, that's definitely something that, that needs to be done is, is, is getting paid for your time. Right. Um, but it also kind of hits on the, the subject of, competitive bid so we competitive bid a lot of these projects probably 50 percent of our projects i would say are competitive bid so when you're in the final stages of that and you're jockeying against another builder or two trying to get the job and you're tightening up your numbers to come back and say well i'm going to charge you design fees now for this that and the other thing it's, it's a little hard so we do have language in our in our specs um, that all cabinetry design is applied to the cabinetry allowance so that kind of covers our neck there. But when you're doing specialty, uh, like tile layouts and things like that, I suppose I should add that language to my <laughs> specs too. Yeah, but, but in sincerity, hard. yeah, I do understand that because it's one thing, and, and you and I attend enough, you know, continuing education. We do enough networking to say, okay, we try to have a good understanding, you know, demographically in the U.S. What are people charging? You know, how do they break their contracts? But the reality is we all have a market, right? You're building in Chicago, right? In the Chicago area. I'm here in Scottsdale. There's only so much that you can charge based on reputation. As you mentioned, if you're competitive, competitively bidding something against someone else, you know, there has to be, uh, you know, something that's enticing them to, hey, we're going to select green side design build at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be out of line um, or you're not going to get the job. It's <laughs> simple as that. Um, the designers that we do work with, um, you know, one of them is Amy Storm. She's pretty popular on um, social media. Don Reeves is another one. We do a lot of projects with both of those 
um, firms, and you know they 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 earn their keep. You know they're not the cheapest designer out there, but they do excellent work, and that's why they're getting so much work. Um, so we like to we like to work together with them to land new projects, um, to get through the projects that we're currently on, and typically the the owner will pay them direct, have a contract with them direct, as as opposed to going through us. So I guess it helps our it helps us from a standpoint of that that's not an added cost onto our contract. Yeah, which makes sense. And that's how we do it too. It's always outsourced client direct with the designer. Now, it's funny because you and I spent a lot of time on Clubhouse early on. I mean, not as much now because we've been so busy. Yeah, but what happened, I know, to, what happened to Clubhouse? I, I don't know. I wonder the same thing because it was like in the beginning, you know, so many of us such as yourself and, and me and others were on there all the time. I mean, it's like every week or a yeah. couple times a week. And then it just like ended and none of us are on that platform anymore. <laughs> and maybe part of it's just the reality of dealing with you know, the economy and supply chain and just how busy we yeah. are. But, but I think what's interesting, you and I had a lot of discussions about at what point in the process decisions should be made. And I know Tom with Lost Creek, who's in your Builder 20 group, right, Tom? Correct, is, yeah. He's like, Brad, are you serious? You really have selections before you break ground? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't I, know how you guys do it without. So like, at what point are you integrating that? Yeah, I've, uh, I think I've said it to you probably 10 times, but I can't believe you can accomplish that. And kudos to you for being able to do that and sticking to your processes because it's great. And just looking at the level of homes that you're building right now on, on Instagram, that, I mean, that are multi million dollar projects with so many different components. And the fact that you can have all those selections completed before you break ground is just amazing. And I, it probably saves you so much time on your schedule that you don't have to be searching and, and trying to get answers for selections as you're building those projects. But yeah, that's one thing where I, if I have to improve, that's one area. I would love to be able to get everything picked out and selected before I break ground. So I might have to bend your ear offline to see, to get yeah. some pointers on that one. Well, well, it's interesting. Cause I think it, you know, it's funny. I, one of the earlier podcasts I had, you know, we we're talking about, you know, it, it's really easy to sit here and, you know, oh, we have, you know, these symptom systems, but the reality is they come from all the mistakes we've made. Right. And right. <laughs> like the pain points. So I, I look back at my career and, you know, some of the most painful projects I had were one, I didn't have an interior designer. And number two, you know, we're making selections throughout the build and it was the worst experience. I mean, the, the home took twice as long. The client was so frustrated you know, we were frustrated with the client and it's just this really, I don't want to say toxic, but it's just a strenuous relationship that, you know, I, so I look back and I feel like it's a little bit easier to set that tone now because you've made those mistakes. And so you can say, look, Michael, if I'm doing your house, here's where this is going to push is going to come to shove. But if we do it now, it doesn't mean you can't change because here's the reality. I'm doing some houses now that are pretty complicated and yeah, all the selections were made. But the client still made 50 changes. I mean, and we're not even at rough, you know? So, I mean, that still happens, which is okay. But at least we have a template, right? A starting point. Sure. So, who on your team puts together the, the, the selections, um, kind of rounds them all together, and, and, and is the go between between the designer, the homeowner, client, and, and your NAFT? That's a really good question. So, on my team right now, we have Megan and Sue, and we're hiring Julia who's going to be our third. She actually starts next, uh, next week. Um, so Sue and Megan are my project coordinators and they do a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. So I, I have a title called project coordinator and what that entails is, uh, ideally, and I'll just go through our process. So it makes sense, Michael. So it, you know, our projects are typically 12 to 18 months in design, right? From when they, they come with us and then we, then we break ground, have permit, and then it's another year to two years for the build. So, I mean, these are long relationships. And so in a perfect world, if this was my perfect scenario, and we started this on the Modern Craftsman a little bit when they had me on a while back, is that they come to me, we have our designer, we have our architect, and we begin this process. And I'm really involved, especially in the beginning, as we're going through floor plan and elevations. And then once we have the house designed, have it plotted, we know it'll look like the size of the rooms. Now the designer gets really heavy into selections, right? While the architect's working through structurals and mechanicals and MPE, civil, everything. Now, as, as we're taking this journey, now I'm integrating Adam, who you met. So Adam's my senior construction manager. He's my estimator. And then Sewer or Megan are assigned projects. And so I'll bring them in. And now they're involved with the designer. Okay, Brad, 
every designer is different. You know, what are you supplying? What am I supplying? Okay, what products and brands are you working with? And so we'll direct them. And now Megan and Sue are really involved in making sure that all the selections are done, cabinetry, lighting, and then they're working on pricing. So with Adam, they're estimating and bidding. So by the time that that home is submitted for permit, we have a full design book, all the selections. We have the full contract docs. Our designers have been involved. They know the ins and outs from every piece of hardware to every piece of tile. And they're actually, my coordinators are writing the, the, the scope and the contracts. So my wow. so they actually, my coordinator writes the scope for every trade. It gets submitted to Adam. He reviews that contract. Then it gets sent to Patrick, who's my general counsel, and he reviews it. So we kind of have three touch points reviewing that contract. I'll look at it with McCall, and then we send that out. And that gives us clear scope. And so when we break ground, our coordinators know everything that's going in the house because they've been involved for the last eight months or a year, essentially. So how many projects at one time will those coordinators be on? Two, three? Well, <laughs> this is why, Rajo, this is where it's a little tough. So in the past, you know, they typically have four, right? Wow. And right now it's like seven. Oh. And so, yeah, where, where it's really tough is seven for one person. This is why I have to really lean on you know, our designers to have really good designers we work with and really good architects that are really good because that allows them to have a little bit more bandwidth on the projects they're working on. But at the same point, it's getting to a point now where we have to bring in another coordinator. So now we could divvy up between the three so they can get back down to that four or five. Because as you know, I mean, you're doing this yourself, Michael. I mean, it's yeah, it's substantial, but we, but we have a special position dedicated to just that. And then the coordinator not only do they know are writing the contracts and understand the finishes, but they're also now working with the superintendent purchasing, right? They're building their schedule, they're ordering appliances, they're doing purchase orders, orders for tile, roofing, you know, a lot of the HOAs will say, okay, Brad, you have to build um, uh, a, a mock-up. And so we'll have, you know, stucco colors and roof tile and shutters. And so they're getting all these samples and putting them up. So then that way it's approved. So I'd imagine communication between your PM and your coordinator is like multiple times a day. <laughs> like, I love you yeah. show that. Yeah. It's funny because they, they speak every day yeah. on every job. And it's funny because like Sue and Megan may work with four different superintendents, right? Uh -huh. Cause I may have four different supers that are on those jobs. So they have to be able to co compartmentalize and know which, you know, supers on each job. The other thing we do is they, they are required. I shouldn't say required, but like part of our SOP, right? Our operating procedures. They meet once a week. So like Sue and Megan will meet once a week with each super on that job. And they'll have an itinerary. They'll have an agenda, right? They write it down, what they're, you know, what's outstanding, what's known, what's unknown, you know, things that are maybe change orders coming, uh, changes by the client. And so they're meeting every week to really get a feel of what's coming. And then additionally, Adam, who's my senior, I, I'm, hopefully I'm not too long when I'm like no, giving my whole I'm, operation. I'm taking notes here. <laughs> <laughs> So then Adam, who's my senior construction manager, I've challenged him. I said, look, you need to be every other week on the job site. So when he goes and walks, and I try to attend these with him as well. So when Adam and I are walking with the superintendent and the coordinator, now the coordinator's on the field as well, and we're going through training or things that are missed or what's upcoming. So we're trying to help from our side, right? Because you tend to get snow blind. You're looking at the same thing all the time. You're going to miss something and it's good to have another set of eyes. So yeah, yeah. so every week, the coordinator is meeting with the superintendent. Cool. Cool. Yeah. It's uh So how do you do it? <laughs> Everything you just said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so how's that how's that possible that you do it all, Michael? Like well, how do you even have time for this podcast? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm fortunate. I have a business partner. He's uh my cousin John. I refer to him as cousin Johnny on on Instagram or social media. But he uh you know, he's a horse of a man. He does a lot of work. He covers a lot of projects, as do I. So we kind of divide and conquer. So right now we have seven projects, but we just finished one. So we had eight, but right now we're at seven. So he's got four. I've got three. Uh, we have three projects in pre-construction and permitting and design. Um, so we'll split those up accordingly. But then uh, once we start construction, you know, we, this is kind of our big selling point too, that we are our project managers. It's a hundred percent owner involvement. The size of our firm, that's, that's a big selling point. Um, we have, we compete against some builders that, you know, they, they don't even touch the job site once or twice a week. It's, it's a superintendent. And to me, I, I like 
probably to my detriment, I'm a little bit of a control freak. So I like to have control of everything. And that comes down to the level of quality. Um, it's like the old Ronald Reagan saying, trust, but verify. So I have to verify yeah. in all the jobs. And my, my cousin, John is the same way. Now he's, he's a little old school. He's lucky if he can turn on his iPhone, he doesn't even have a computer. <laughs> um, I try to get him on Builder Trend, and his response is, "I am Builder Trend." <laughs> so that's one of the one of the things I'm trying to push through to, to get a little more streamlined and automated on, on Builder Trend. I probably use it to about twenty percent of its capacity. We mainly use scheduling and uh, change order and the um, the job site notes or our logs, daily logs. Um, but it is a good tool. I know you guys use it pretty heavily. Yeah, we're but, big on build a trend. But so let me ask you this, Mike, if I interrupt you. I mean, with yeah. you and John, I mean, you divvy up the projects. Uh, are you involved into the day and day superintendent or do you have superintendents out there and you're overseeing them? No, we're we're the superintendents too. So we have we have two laborers that are uh they're not basic laborers, they're almost a superintendent. They won't do any scheduling or they won't do um they won't really converse with the, the subcontractors on scope. Uh, we direct them what to do. So, I mean, it's not uncommon for John and I, you'll catch us some point in the day pushing a broom and, and stacking trim. And then an hour later, we're doing a walkthrough with a client and a designer laying out tile. So we're, we're at the point now, we could probably handle four or five projects each. And if it gets past that, it's we're going to have to get somebody else. But right now, that's kind of okay. So, I, so what's the size of the company then? The size of the company? As far as yeah, so is it just just me? Yeah, people like employees. You, me, John, um, two laborers slash superintendents, and we have a a girl that comes into the office uh, part time twice a week for some bookkeeping. So we're we're pretty lean. I'm amazed at how efficient you are. You are super lean. That's incredible. I would have never guessed that. You know, seeing from afar. Well, we try our best. You know, and that's one area, Brad, that I'm I probably really terrible is is um, human resources hiring. I'm, I'm just Anytime I hear you on a podcast or, or talking in person, I absorb all that knowledge because I, I'm terrible at it. It's, 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 and in this market, trying to find labor is just hard enough to begin with. So maybe you can speak to how you, your hiring process and what you use to find all these, these great people you have under you. I mean, I met, I met your guys at, the, at IBS and thoroughly impressed. You know, they're all super knowledgeable, super nice guys. Um, no slouches, so to speak. Yeah, I, I would agree. I will say um, th- this is one of those things, you know, I often say you're better lucky than good, right? It's a, <laughs> I think it's true to a lot of things in life, but uh, hiring, it's interesting. So I, I listened to a podcast last week. In fact, Greg, who produced my podcast, he um, he had me listen to a podcast with uh, a, a gentleman who started Parkinson's and they're here local, they're in Phoenix and they you know, they do like 250 million a year, right? It's a wow. mechanical plumbing service. You know, they're in the service industry. So they're, they're working with homeowners that, you know, their AC goes out, which in Arizona is a, a massive problem in the summer. But he was asked on the podcast, you know, about hiring. And he said, you know, his comment was, you know, the reason that if it's that important to you, you're going to spend money and time on it, right? And he said, you know, when people say, I can't find good help, and this is nothing against you, Mike. I'm just saying what, you know, his theory was. He said, um, a lot of it is, well, how much time are you putting in? Are you putting in five minutes a week? Are you putting in 10 hours a week? You know, are you willing to invest 30 grand, 50 grand in finding good people, finding good people? And I know when, when you and I were scheduling the podcast, you had asked me this just about the hiring and, and I gave it some thought. And, you know, when I say looking and good, I, you know, was fortunate before I started my company, I worked for a, a large builder in town and, you know, through college, I did construction management college and I met some good peers and you got to see, you know, things that made them successful, you know, communication and determination, competitiveness, right? I think these are things that make for good employees, someone who's competitive and, and a driver, right? Someone who's going to be uh, looking ahead as much as they can. And so there were some key people that I met. I worked for a company, had 300 employees. And wow. there was no doubt, there's some cherry picking, right? That you take the three best. And from there, it's you start building reputation. And, you know, like Spencer, who you met, I mean, he's someone who I was in college with. So I've known Spencer for like 18 years and I know his family and I know his drive and I know his work ethic. And, you know, you start to piece this together. And then you get the, the reason I say, like, it's not just a relationship side, but 
one of the top architects in town, he reached out and said, Hey, Brad, my son's looking for an internship. And this is Canon who you met out there. And you know, one of the benefits of Canon is probably similar to you, Michael, where this is someone that grew up as an architect. He knows CAD, he can draw, he can design, but he didn't want to do architecture. He wanted to do building. And he was at ASU, he's construction manager. So he interned for me for two years. And the, I already told him I'm hiring him. So the minute he graduated from ASU <laughs> construction management, he had a full-time job and now he's running some amazing projects and he's helping, you know, lay stuff out. And so, you know, you start to build this culture of people. And, and what I found is that um, there's an investment, right? As you look at the bottom line, as you know this, Michael, I mean, there's no doubt that there's costs, right? There's labor costs. And I'm sure my payroll, it looks a lot different than other companies out there, you know, and that, uh, you but know, you get what you pay for. To, you get what you pay for. Yeah. And the thing is, I've realized that, hey, you take care of them and you pay them well and you give them a runway there and you give them the resources. And I, I know that all my team is paid really well, but they're really good and they work really hard and we have great camaraderie. So I feel pretty lucky in that, in that sense. Yeah. Well, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? It is true. I mean, you create your own luck to some yeah. extent, right? Yeah. But, but I just, I, you know, and part of it is... Um, it it's neat too. I do enjoy, you know, there there is some work to hiring and training and I'll be open. I mean, my one of my weaknesses is systems. I mean, it just is like for me, I I know how to finish a house. I know how to build a schedule, right? I know how to, you know, determine my day, how I'm gonna be most effective today, you know, and balance all the things I have on my plate. And and I'm good at that, but how do I teach that? I'm not that great at that, right? I'm not good at like documenting that line. Whereas, and that's where I have a controller, McCall, and McCall is super detailed and she understands how to lay out the scope of work and then she can hand that off. So you have to use different people for their strengths too, um, because she's really good at that. And that's really helped really create the systems of batons, as you mentioned, you know, well, what does a coordinator do? What does a super do? And, and that handoff. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like you're pretty good at systems. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are now, but it's taken, it's been painful nine years. Like I've been you know, I've had the company for nine years now. So, I mean, for, for you, Mike, I, mean, I guess what, what's been your hiring experience or have, you know, have you spent a lot of time or, or you know, how does that look moving forward, especially with well, your that's growth? That's a good question. And to your point, I haven't put a lot of time into it. I have, we haven't needed to, you know, coming out of the recession in 2008, uh, it was John and I, we had our tool belts back on, you know, before that I was developing subdivisions and it was a giant game of hot potato. If you had land, you know, the land, the value of land just plummeted. So we took a big hit. Uh, John and I joined forces right after the recession. We formed Greenside and we were remodeling. You know, we had our tool belts on and we were slapping up walls, and hanging drywall and, and doing everything we could. And then it just eventually blossomed into new work, um, word of mouth reputation. And that's where we the position we've been in ever since. So we haven't had a need for a big team. You know, we, we kept it lean. Um, now we're to the point where the jobs are really starting to come in hot and heavy. We've turned down a lot of work this year. A lot of it is remodeling just because we can't get to it. And, you know, sometimes part of me says, you know, if we had more people, we probably could have taken some of that work. So I, it's something I, I definitely have to work on. Um, like you said, put, putting time into it. One question I kind of have for you with your employees, do you have scheduled or, or different intervals for um, employee reviews? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Michael. So we do. Um, so formally, we sit down uh, every June and December, right? And so twice a year. Um, the big one, of course, is end of year. And, you know, I challenge them to set goals and come prepared to this meeting with goals. And they, they write the goals for the year. And then we evaluate that. And, you know, mid-year is a little bit, it's not as formal as, Dece you know, the November, December one. Um, but we do. And I think that's key because I, I know from as an, when I was an employee, um, there's something to be said about being accountable, right? When someone makes you accountable, you're going to perform yeah. better. And when someone challenged me, you know, because I'm competitive to have goals and to push for that, and then they're actually tracking that. You know, it's not just like, okay, Michael, here's my goal. You know, see you next year. We'll create three new ones. But if you're actually making them accountable, I mean, there's going to be a determination to, to solve those and to complete those. And it's easy to get busy in the mundane day to day and, and not understand that communication one-on-one. -on -one. And, and so, and, and, 
in addition to that, I'll, you know, I try to do lunch as much as I can. And so with my team. So like today I took four of them to lunch. And you know why I have, we're kind of spaced out right throughout greater Phoenix yeah. area. So depending on what side of town, I'll take that crew out. And, you know, we, I have 17 of us now in the company. Wow. I mean, we have 17 employees. And so I try to group that around, you know, with all 17 of us. And what I find is even at those meetings, you know, I give them a hard time. I'm like, Hey, Michael, you know, if you're my employer, I'd be like, why is your house dead yet? Like what's taking so long? <laughs> and so you have these little accountable moments and it's not just, it's just business at lunch, but we can, you know, chat, well, what are you doing with what's upcoming? How can I help? You know, because the reality is as owner of the company, there are certain leverage I have where if they're not getting a certain trade, I could call and hopefully arrange that. So I think those points, those touch points, you know, from company outings to lunches, I mean, those are just little things where you have- So you're staying uh, involved, you're keeping promoting. your head in to see what's going on with your employees and see how they're doing and seeing if they're reaching those goals or, or working towards those goals. Yeah, you have to. And I, I will call them out too. And they know that especially you know, when it comes to the goals or certain things where they, for lack of a better word, know better, you know, maybe on a scheduling thing or maybe a bus or an air we had that, hey guys, like we've talked about this, you, you know, and, and a little call to repentance, if you will. <laughs> um, but that, you know, build a trend's been key too, because, you know, you use that, Michael. And, and for us, you know, they're, they're really good at doing their daily logs and updating. So I can also see the progress. So it really helps when I meet with them to really feel, get a feel of, hey, are you doing your daily logs? You know, where are we at? Why is this being delayed? And then at least make sure that we're not dropping the ball anymore. This episode is brought to you by Pella Windows. When it comes to building homes at AFT, almost every project has Pella Windows. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to, to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. They're, their company culture, their integrity, their honesty. You know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. For those of you that have listened to the podcast, you know how big of a fan we are of Build a Trend and that we have used this software for the last four years. And many of the guests that we've brought on the podcast are also Build a Trend users. And in this day and age, with as busy as all of us are in construction, as complicated as it is with escalation pricing, lead times, tracking, organization, all of us need a good project management software to help simplify and organize our business. And there are a couple of features that we love a ton about Build a Trend. And one is the owner portal, the other is the daily logs. And these are features that we use daily, right? Half of my clients are out of state. And as an owner, it is so imperative how we communicate with our clients, with our team, with our customers. And through Build a Trend, this allows us that quick connection. They can check at any time. We can communicate with them. We're up to date. This has actually helped us win jobs, win projects because of that organization, especially at pre construction. And Build a Trend also offers a ton of service on the back end, training and understanding and workshops, you know, to help us use our software effectively. They also have the podcast, The Building Code. To learn more, head to buildertrend.com backslash AFT to get a 60-day money-back guarantee on your Builder Trend account. That's 60 days to make sure you love this product with no pressure, and I know you will. Okay, so how do you organize your time? Because it is so hard. I don't think people realize to hire a company with a good superintendent, right? When they're hiring Greenside Design Build and you guys have the skill set uh, that you and John do, uh, it's a lost art, right? The ability to communicate and schedule and manage. And it's really hard. And I tell people all the time, I've been building professionally in Phoenix for 17 years. I mean, I've been in construction my whole life. It is so much harder to build a house today 
in 2022 than it's ever been, than I've ever seen, even in the recession that you yes. and I lived through. And so how in the world are you managing four projects when you can't be there physically? Because the reality is, as much as we love our trade partners, if you're not holding their hand in a lot of cases and overseeing them, it's not that they're always going to take the easy route, but there's miscommunication things dropped. I mean, things are missed. It's just For sure, the reality. Sure. Well, one benefit we have is we're primarily focused in three or four towns that are right next door to each other. So I can pop to all four of my jobs within 45 minutes if I had to. So you'll hit the first job at 7.30 in the morning, 8 o'clock, and you'll stay there. Maybe you only have to meet a, a sub for 15 minutes to show them what's going on, and you'd run literally a block over to the next house, um, meet another guy, check on some work, shoot over to the next job. So I'll have all my jobs hit within to two hours easily. And that leaves time then to maybe run back to a job to, to meet a designer or meet a client or run into the office and, you know, write up a proposal or do some change orders, do some accounting, that type of stuff. So I, I try to keep a, a regimented schedule, but it's, it's just hard because you'll sit, yeah, you'll Impossible. sit down like today I sat down to do some change orders and I had to go submit a permit fee, a permit extension fee, because obviously the schedule's longer now because of lead time. So I had to run in and get that in before, into the village before lunch. So we kind of just play it by ear and we wing it. We've been doing it long enough where we know where to push and we know how to fit everything in. My wife will tell you I'm a workaholic because I'm all, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I'll start it. I start my day at five o'clock. I go work out and then when I'm done, I'm on the computer before I eat breakfast and sending out, you know, emails, checking schedules. And then some days I don't get done till nine or 10 o'clock. Now I know there's a lot of us in the industry that do that, right. but at a certain point you can't, you can't do it every single day. And, uh, I hear about it when I, <laughs> when I do, <laughs> but that's what I mean. I mean, it's so much because even throughout the day, I mean, it, it there could be an issue, there could be a leak, there could be a question on the shower detail. I mean, whatever it is that interrupts, right? That phone yeah. ringing that you have to answer. And so you just get pulled all these different ways. Do you feel that there's an advantage? I know getting into the partnership idea, you have a partner. How does that, and it sounds like there's a lot of yin and yang, right? Between you and there John. That, yeah, uh, it's good coordination. I mean, has, has that always been seamless or has there been uh, a challenge there? I, luckily it's been seamless. You know, um, we're, we're pretty close. We're, we're, practically like brothers. Um, we've had a lot of life issues that were, uh, the same. We both had, uh, parents that, that uh, were taken from us early. So we kind of connected at a young age and, uh, we're just always on the same wavelength. So if, if he has a problem on a job, you can call me and I'll run over and vice versa. Um, you know, where it really helps too, is if, if one of us wants to go out of town for a weekend or for a week, you know, yes, write down cover you. quick schedule. Yeah. Here, here's what I got going. Just make sure this gets done. Um, it's typically all scheduled, but the, we have the confidence knowing that there's a an experienced eye checking the work and making sure it's done right. Um, so yeah, having a partner is, to me, with John is a huge advantage. Um, I know I've heard Nick say it before, and my, my attorney always tells it to me that partners are for dancing. <laughs> well, we're we're dancing pretty that. well here. So, yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this then. I mean, how? And, and maybe it's formal, maybe it's not so formal. How do you divvy up responsibilities, whether it be business development or warranty or, um, uh, you well, know, we both, we both have our, we both have our strong suits. You know, he'll take more pride. If we have a, an odd number of projects, he'll always take uh, the extra project because I do a lot of the office work. I said he's, he's just not an office guy. Um, and in any partnership, even in a marriage, you know, there's, things that you're going to have to do more than your partner. And that's just the way it is. And sometimes you're going to be doing less than your partner is doing. And I think the sooner someone accepts that and realizes it and just know it's, it's what you're doing is for the benefit of the team, then you're not going to have problems with it. And there's our days where I do more and there's days where John does more and we just get on with it. And we have our days where we blow up and we chew each other's head off and scream and yell <laughs> But, you know, it, it's like water off a duck's back. And part of that's probably, I suppose, our personalities. We don't really let it get to us because we'll go at it some days and we'll 
he'll think he's right and I'll think I'm right and we'll just butt heads. But uh, we get past it, you know. And I suppose we're fortunate that part of our partnership is, is um, you know, s- successful due to our personalities. We're both pretty chilled out. Yeah, there's nice. something to be That's said from having some thick skin too, be able to, to oversee yeah. that and not get too emotionally involved. And you know, back to your point about the competition, we'll, we'll compete. We'll compete to get our projects done faster. And we'll say, well, why is that taking you so long? What's the problem <laughs> over there? Do I, do I need to go over there and straighten it out? But uh, no, it's, it's been good. It's been good. Well, you had, you had Joe with Cardinal Crest, Joe Christensen on your, on, or on your Instagram Live. And I know he just did yeah. an episode, you know, monocross and him and Adam, and they have a partnership similar to you. And it's very similar methodologies that you're stating with like you and John that look, we understand at the end of the day, we're 50, 50 partners and we need to make it work. We don't get too emotionally involved on who's doing what we just, you know, you kind of both put your head down and work really hard and, and try to coordinate the best you can. Yeah. I, I met those guys at IBS and, uh, had a long chat with them. Super intelligent guys, super ambitious. And they, they've got it dialed in. You know, they were, they were college buddies, college, I don't know if they were roommates, but they were buddies, yeah. buddies in college and made the decision to, to go out to um, Kansas City together right out of college. And it's just, that's, that's a, a pretty brave uh, move, you know, for the two. They didn't have any connections out there and, and they've just done really well. And now they're, now they're just rocking it out there. And they, he did mention in the, in the IG live that, yeah, this, it's kind of a yin and a yang for their partnership and they don't get too excited. They don't get too upset with each other and it just works. So from a scheduling side, do you both schedule your own projects or is there some cross coordination? We both schedule our, our own projects. Um, so there will be times where we're, we both need the same sub at the same time. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> who, who wins that arm wrestle? Uh, I guess it's a case by case basis. You know, <laughs> we'll see. Like right, right now we've got two projects on and we needed the framer at the same time. So, um, luckily our framer has a, has a big enough crew. So he started on John's job a little earlier. He just started on my job now and he split his crew a little bit. So we're, we're going, uh, and they're pretty complicated framing jobs. So we don't need them to go fast. I'd prefer them to go, you know, slow, slow is fast. Yeah. Uh, so we don't miss anything. So. You know, it works out in that in that standpoint. But we do schedule our own jobs. Um, I schedule mine on Builder Trend. He uses a legal pad, but he still gets them <laughs> <some> done. <laughs> oh, so hold on. Like, I I just laugh because it is funny because you definitely have this yin and yang. We're using Builder Trend. He's using legal pad, but but it still works for him, right? And so, what has been his resistance to maybe get a little bit more automated? Because for the trades, if you're using the same trades, I'm sure like okay, John and Michael. I mean, this is totally separate his resistance he's like the great wall of china he doesn't want to even touch open a computer but in fairness if we were both building houses he probably builds a house a little bit faster than i do um maybe because he doesn't have to do all the paperwork but yeah <laughs> he, he gets he gets them done fast he does and uh, he doesn't miss a beat he's he's a really good builder and uh you know I, that's why i don't push too hard on the on the technology side because he's still getting it done so was there any resistance or reservations he had when, cause I, I would imagine you're running all the Instagram then and social media for the company. Did he have any opposition to that? Not opposition. He just makes fun of me all the time for <laughs> <laughs> being on Instagram, but in all honesty, and I don't know if you've seen it, but I've, I've noticed a definite uptick in potential business from Instagram. I've noticed an, a bigger awareness. You know, I try and portray who we really are. I try to portray our experience and our knowledge in the market. Um, I think that's coming through. Sometimes I throw a little bit of comedy in there when you see Cardinal Crest, how funny they, you know, they are. And uh, they're so I good think, on TikTok, noticed, like they do all the trends. It's so funny. <laughs> I haven't really got too good on TikTok yet, one at a time. But yeah, I'm still an old guy. But uh, it, it's helped, and you know, your social media presence is. is pretty impressive so i try to take notes when i see all your stuff you know the, the podcast the youtube videos instagram i mean it all helps you have to see it help yeah it does i totally agree and what's interesting is you know it, it, as if you were to advise someone who's starting out and, and you alluded to a couple of strategies you have i mean what strategies should should a builder designer architect focus on especially when 
looking about how they're going to portray themselves who, through Instagram or any platform? Well, number one, you have to be yourself. You, you can't be fake or, or somebody else because it's going to come through. And, you know, when that client comes to meet you and that you're not who you are on Instagram or social media, there's going to be some questions going up. Like this, this guy, that's actually a big check against you. This guy's not who he says he is or this person who is they say they are. So be yourself. Um, after that, I really can't give any great information. I'm pretty new at it myself. I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't have a video production crew. I don't have all this, this type of stuff to promote. I'm just, just I'm start just your myself. own like Nick. Yeah. I don't know how he has time for all that stuff and he's so good at it. So I, you know, kudos to him. He's, he is changing the industry for sure. Um, and yourself. But it's, yeah, I love that. I love being yourself. And um, it's funny. I mean, one thing I'll add to that when you talk about be yourself, Michael, which I think that's great advice, is one thing I saw early on is one of the, at least I see the advantages, as you mentioned, not only are there a lot of platforms and demographics and the, the people are different from LinkedIn to YouTube to Instagram or TikTok, um, but you can really portray your practice, your mindset, you know, the way you run your project, the way you, maybe you keep it clean. But what I found the most successful, at least what gravitates to me, is I've seen a couple different strategies. And one of the best, and this really aligns with what you're saying, be yourself, is I've found that the most successful builders are ones like you, Michael, that just say, hey, here's my process. Here's what I do. Here's the thought behind this. And it's never, hey, I'm available. Just call me You know, at the number. It's very non-soliciting, right? Where it's not like, in every comment, this is what we do. Call me. Here's the number. Here's the email. It's just, hey, you'll let the product, the end result, the systems do the talking and you don't have to oversell it. And I do love that about social media. And I think any advice would be don't always put in this caveat, caveat that, hey, you need to call me or, you know, just let, let it, let it speak for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. And you know, that the consumer is smarter than you think. Um, at, at the level of homes that, that we build and that you build, you know, those are very well-educated people buying those homes. So they do, they do do their homework. Um, what you put on social media is something I, I only see it as a reinforcement of what you do. Um, they're going to look you up, you know, they're going to look you up on LinkedIn, on, the, on your website. They're going to talk to people. You typically, I mean, a lot of what we do is word of mouth. So they already know somebody that, that built a house with you and they're asking them what, what's happening and how was the experience and do they know what they're doing? And so social media, Instagram is just a reinforcement of that. Um, that's how I see it anyhow. So what is the, uh, I know you've spoken about like the 12 and 36 month look ahead. What is that? Well, given the current environment that we're in, you know, we've got a, a great run the last 10 years and nothing lasts forever. Um, our, our, as far as Greenside, our next 12 months is, is busy. It's pr pretty much a repeat of last year as far as number of projects and scope of projects. Now, the year after that, um, we'll probably be finishing some of those. I can definitely see a little bit of a slowdown. You know, rates are going to creep up. Um, inflation has just uh, gone crazy. We've already had people take pause before they pull the trigger, but luckily they are pulling the trigger. Um, but we didn't have that pause before. So if it, if the inflation continues, people are going to stop. Uh, I can see us taking on a lot more uh, renovation or remodel projects where we haven't been as, haven't been doing as many in the last three four years, uh, which is fine. Uh, but I I actually welcome a little bit of a slowdown because I want to see lead times come back into check. I want to see subcontractors numbers come back into check. Uh, I wouldn't mind a, little, a slight slowdown. Yeah, I, I think everyone can agree that right now it's just, it's been, as I said, it's been more difficult to build a house now than ever. And it's just, everyone's overworked. I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you. A lot of the labor pool we're working with, you know, they're working Saturdays, Sundays. At some point they, they get burnt out, they get tired and we're human, right? There's only so much capacity all of us have. For sure. For sure. And, and, and it's skilled labor too. When you talk about labor, the skilled labor is just evaporating so quickly. Three years ago, we had probably four framing crews that we could bounce between. Only one of those crews exists now. So that's why we got caught with, you know, two houses needing the same framing contractor. Same yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
it's it's going to be a big problem. So what what's your normal build cycle? I know it varies because you have a huge complexity and array of projects, you know, from remodel to new construction. But typically, what is that cycle? Uh, construction time? Or pre- yeah. Um, I, I would say pre-construction. What is your normal pre-construction? And then from when you break ground to completion. Pre-construction from the time we sit down uh, at contract and get through the architect phase is probably six months. Then we probably have another three months of permitting. Um, we try and get some selections done in that period. Um, so we're, what is that, nine nine months to 12 months pre-construction, and then actual shovel in the ground, start construction is 12 to 18 months. You know, it depends on the size of the house. And you, you have know, a our, big, I mean, the big, I mean, from size of house, I mean, you do some pretty big homes as well. Yeah, we range from 4,000 square feet above grade to probably 8,000 square feet. Um, we don't include the basement square footage. You know, that, that could be another 2,000 to 3,000 square feet on top of that. Um, why don't they include that? Or why don't you, as you're referencing size? Uh, it's just the way it's done in this area. When you talk square I mean, are they footage, finished basements? Or are they they, they are finished. They are finished. But when you say a, a 6,000 square foot house, it's 6,000 square foot above grade plus a finished basement. Huh. Um, and when we give our price- Because here per- they include the basement. We do have a lot of basements, but they include that in the livable. I didn't think they had a lot of basements in Arizona. You do, huh? Yeah. They, you, you know, it's funny, like real quick. I mean, the reality is that people always ask, why don't they have basements in Arizona? And you, I mean, to some extent, you know, we don't have a frost line, right? So we're not digging down six feet for, you know, utilities and mm-hmm. water and everything else. And so for- for other parts of the country, you're already going down. Why not go another couple of feet and put a basement in? That That's part of it. But the other part is we have some really bad soil conditions too. So like in some areas of town, it's like all rock and cleachy and clay. And it just, it would be astronomically sure. expensive. But we do have farmland. So I would say we do a lot of basements. In fact, if you came down, I could tour you through a couple. But in the East Valley, so like Gilbert, Chandler, even parts of Mesa where it's more farmland, a lot of basements in that area. And then when you get into the hills, like, you know, North Scottsdale and even PV, Paradise Valley, it's not really, a, it, it's a walkout basement, right? Because you're up on the hill, so it's a little bit yeah. kind of a modified basement. But but yeah, otherwise, there's not a whole lot. It just depends on the soil type, which can really vary here in town. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, but when we and talk And it's more expensive price a basement because we don't do them all the time, so it's it's not very cheap, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, every house here has a basement and it's cheap space to finish once, you know, once the foundation is in but when we give our price per square foot numbers everything is above grade um we don't so you don't count that. the basement in your square foot price no so i guess it's all you, relevant you, to your area yeah yeah but when you do and some builders play this game here and you have to educate the client when you do include the basement square footage your price per square foot number shoots way down it's a you know it's a false number when you include just the above grade um square footage it's going to go up and that's the true number. And on the MLS here, you're not allowed to, to use below grade square footage in your MLS. You have to use it as a separate finished space square footage. So it's all, it's all a numbers game, you know? Yeah. And I think where I can relate that is here's the garage, right? There's a lot of car people in Arizona. There's a lot of big garages and that can vary. You know, typically, uh, I know some may laugh at this podcast, but typically in the custom homes, you'll do a four car garage. It's pretty standard. You know, but you may have some that do an eight car or 16 car or 20 car, and then maybe an RV garage that completely throws off the square foot. And I, it's probably important for you where, yeah, may, most people may do a 2000 square foot basement, but what happens when you're doing an 8,000 square foot basement? Yeah. Yeah. Or does sure. that ever happen? It, it happens. It happens. And we do a lot of deep, extra deep basements for sport courts uh, where you're digging down right. 22, 23 feet. We have a number of those going on right now. Um, but I thought in Arizona, is it? You give a square footage on area cooled or under air conditioning. Is that true? Yeah, it's funny. For us, it's always air conditioned space, right? It's never like heated space, which you use probably heated space. For us, it's always air conditioned space, and that determines a livable square footage. <laughs> and I'm we don't, sure, we, I'm it sure doesn't you get air cold enough. in your garages, too. You have to, right? We do a lot, actually. Uh, you know, it, it's not as common unless the client has, you know, some luxury cars or something that they want to keep, you know, out of stock temperature um but we do air condition a lot of the garages here wow it's just funny to, in different parts of the country how things are done differently and 
being able to talk to so many different builders in different parts of the country and just educate yourself on how things are built and why they're built that way. It's interesting. Do you have a lot of clients in your area that have gotten into whether building science or sustainability or solar? I mean, are these, how has that affected your market? In- incrementally, we have one project now where we're actually putting solar on the roof. Um, it's, def- it's by far not going to power the entire house. It's just supplemental. Um, it's more of a lifestyle choice, to be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. As far as building science, it's, it's gaining ground. Um, you know, we kind of have a saying in our, in our sales pitch, people care more about the green in their pocket than the green on the house. And (laughs) it's true though. It it is true, but it's, it's the tide is starting to turn. And when you have people like, um, Nick Schiffer and, um, Matt Reisinger, who's really promoting the uh, building science that catches on. We just had a client, um, they didn't proceed with the build because it came in, the budget was too high. but they were going to go almost passive and there's not a lot of passive houses going on around here. There's not enough government incentive in our area. Um, but I am passive certified. So I'm, I'm looking for that passive house client. Um, they're hard to find, but it, it's catching on. And we was certainly, we build our homes now to a certain level. That's a little bit more than, uh, the competition. As far as building science, we use all the Sega house wraps, the Sega tapes, big into air sealing. You know, we don't just rely on the spray foam to get our air sealing done. Um, and a lot of our competitors, they, they, they don't even acknowledge that, to be honest with you. Um, and it's sad to see. I'd like to see the, the, the market in general lift, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. But it'll get there. It'll get there. It takes I, I know time. I that, mean, either. Sorry to interrupt. That? You have the net zero house going, don't you? We do, and that that's been super excited. I was super excited about this opportunity. So Mark La Liberté, who does, he owns, well, he's partners with Construction Instruction in Denver, and they do a lot of um, like building science and building envelope instruction there in Denver. You know, you or I or any contractor can sign up for. So a little plug for him. But um, but this is his house, and we partner with Professional Builder Magazine, and it's their home of the year, and it's super exciting because yeah, there's. We've done a lot of ICF, right? Insulated concrete form construction and, you know, SIPs, trusses, and, you know, as much as we can in our market, try to get involved in some of the new technology and energy efficiency. But to do this true net zero has been amazing because there's just a lot of eye opening, you know, how we're doing thermal breaks and insulating the foundation, which in Arizona never happens. No one's insulating the foundation (laughs) or the slab here, right? Um, It's just not cold enough. And, you know, heat, it's not like you're getting a ton of heat on a slab, but at the same time, it makes a big difference, especially in the winter because the ground's still cold. I mean, it can, you saw, I mean, for anyone that followed, it snowed right at his house. (laughs) Like we had snow in Arizona and people are like, is this really Arizona and Scottsdale? I'm like, yeah, it is. And it snowed. And so, I mean, it's rare, but every couple of years we'll get snow there. But, um, but the building science techniques are neat because I do have a lot of clients that, as you mentioned, I mean, the green in their pocketbook is different than the green. But however, with that said, there are some clients that, um, whether it be, hey, I want to be off the grid because who knows with the the volatility of power grid and municipalities, like what happened in Dallas, I just want to be independent or I'm willing to invest because I do want to be a little bit more sustainable, a little bit more energy efficient, you know, as I think globally, you know, on and footprint. And so clients are looking at that where it's not so much a dollar, but having the opportunity to build this, you know, it does create a lot of opportunity for us to, you know, showcase what we're doing there. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty helpful too. Uh, you know, we talked about it earlier, the builder 20 groups. Um, we've got our meeting in a couple of months. I know you've got your meeting this week, but I, I just, uh, started in my builder 20 group last year. Um, as long as I've been building, I haven't been a part of one. And it it was a huge mistake because there is a lot of now a wealth of knowledge that you get from all those other builders. Um, as far as building science, Dan Duvall, uh, he's, you had him on the podcast last week. He's in my Builder 20 group, mm-hmm. and he's just been great. Um, he does a lot of similar projects to, to what uh, we build, and we just exchange ideas all the time. Um, the, finan- the financial part of the Builder 20 group is, is huge. Um, it's huge. It's huge. So I know you have a big uh, following on your podcast of builders, and I would recommend all of them get into a Builder 20 group because it's, it's like a board of directors for you. And it's just been... Super helpful. 
It's the best advice. I mean, you've given a lot of good advice today, Michael, but that one in itself, you know, I, one of the mentors I had in town, he put his arm around me, I don't know, four years ago. And he said, Brad, get in and build a 20 group. And I did. And it like changed, changed my entire company. I mean, you can't even put into words like what a difference it makes. Um, as you mentioned, because at the end of the day, look, we're all struggling. We all are trying to figure this out. And, you know, every company's different. Your operation is much different than mine. We're in different territories. But at the same time, there's still a lot of consistencies that we can apply that sure. better my business than yours, you know, from being part of this. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, a lot of the clients we build houses for, you know, they're CEOs, they're executives, and they're in these CEO groups and their businesses thrive because of this. Even though they're in different industries, you, you learn so much from, you know, a business standpoint, from marketing standpoint, um, that just helps your business tremendously. So these builder 20 groups are actually focused for building. So it's, I, I, I love them. Well, I love, I love that advice as we close here, Michael. I love your, uh, your passion for the industry, the friendship you and I built. And, um, you know, just let us a little inside the Greenside Design Build. I feel so much more educated now. And I'm still amazed, like, the fact that you <laughs> help with design, you're drawing, you're running projects. Like, I, my mind's blown today. So I don't know how I'm going to, like, put this together as we leave this conversation. But what do you, what do you have that's upcoming and exciting for those listening? Well, um, this year, we're going to work on our marketing a little bit. We're putting together a couple of video series on some of our projects that we've just started. So stay tuned for that. It's, it'll be a, a little while in the making, but it'll come down the channels pretty soon. Um, we're going to work on a, a little YouTube channel as well, try and get some videos uploaded nice. there. Um, and then just more of the same, more pretty cool projects, custom homes. Uh, we like to keep it interesting. We like to take on unique projects. And... Uh, I guess some more Instagram, some more IG lives. That's pretty much it. I love your IG lives. Well, this conversation went too fast. I think I have to have you back on because uh, this hour went by way too fast. So anytime, but but for but I'll, I'll be yeah, asking, we'll get I'll you on asking again. You more questions, <laughs> <laughs> please do. But for those uh, those listening, where can they find you? Uh, our website is greensidedesignbuild.com. You can find us on Instagram at greenside. Um, Greenside, what's the, it's not a, uh, the under slash underscore, Greenside underscore, uh, underscore, design yeah. underscore build, um, and Facebook. And, um, uh, that's pretty much it. Well, we'll have that tag in yeah. the handle. So Type Michael, because thank, my thank explanation you. Thank you. was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have it typed yeah. out. They'll be able to click on it and be hyperlinked. So we'll be good. Cool. Well, thanks Brad. Appreciate it. This was fun. Thanks Michael. Right, take it easy. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.